and that has led to more and more geopolitical risks of geopolitical events mm -hmm. the culmination of course of the russia ukraine war and i think that india realized that in order to play a bigger role in world affairs and that was the agenda of the modi government the second the second yeah, term i think you need you need a good hard power to project soft power exactly so that's where india wanted to make its uh, self present and project itself as a large defense self sufficient nation yeah which it's is also, why the boost was given it's also worth mentioning that india is the largest importer of arms in the world and i think historically we've always been with good reason worried about our currency so reducing import dependencies is never a bad idea absolutely i think it's great to reduce dependence and atmanirbhar the policy of atmanirbhar of the modi government that is the very foundation of why defense stocks are going up Okay so welcome to the 14th episode of uh, the Indian market story and we're here to talk about the defense sector a uh, really interesting sector one that's rallied very strongly in recent months and also something that's very critical to our national security and defense defense stocks are the flavor of the season and uh, they are great in any market <laughs> they are defensive in a bear market and they give great returns in a bull market as well so i think it's a great uh, subject on which to do this podcast yeah so um let's maybe talk about some some recent recent news flow around the defense stocks particularly uh where some demand is coming from and uh, let's start with the elephant in the room right um i think one of the big triggers for the recent rally in defense stocks was the russia ukraine war and particularly um now that a lot a lot of russian equipment is being consumed in ukraine in ukraine they're you know very unreliable defense supplier um they're not their equipment is not producing at the quality that it was thought previously um and you know they're one of the major defense suppliers for india and so now that india needs to reorient its def defense supply chain away from russia uh local defense stocks are you know very very much poised to uh, benefit from this see the ukraine war started in 2022 but india's effort to indigenize its defense production started well before that and let me just take you back a few decades and bring it forward as well and tell you something very interesting about why defense stocks are the flavor of the season and why they are expected to do so well going ahead as well so you remember the berlin wall mm -hmm. it fell on 9th november 1989 okay that was the point where the cold war ended then we had nearly 40 years of us hegemony they were the only super power somewhere around 2018 US started imposing tariffs and trade restrictions on China. 2018 was the year in which the Chinese also made some changes in their constitution and removed the two year term for Z. Yeah, Xi Jinping. Yeah. Jinping, right? Yeah, and he's subsequently become more, more and more, more of a powerful. dictator. Yeah. 2019 Narendra Modi re-election the second time. 2020 Russian uh, parliament makes some changes and effectively Putin is the president till 2036. Yeah. 2020 was the year in which there was the clash between India and China as well. So what has happened is that right from 2018-19 onwards, uh, we have seen the world becoming a multipolar world, mm -hmm. and that has led to more and more geopolitical risks of geopolitical events. Mm -hmm. The culmination, of course, of the Russia-Ukraine war, and I think that India realized that in order to play a bigger role in world affairs, and that was the agenda of the Modi government, the second. the second yeah, term i think you need you need a good hard power to project soft power exactly so that's where india wanted to make its uh, self present and project itself as a large defense self sufficient nation yeah which it's is also, why the boost was given it's also worth mentioning that india is the largest importer of arms in the world and i think historically we've always been with good reason worried about our currency so reducing import dependencies is never a bad idea absolutely i think it's great to reduce dependence and atmanirbhar the policy of atmanirbhar of the modi government that is the very foundation of why defense stocks are going up absolutely so um i think we've we've segregated defense stocks into three broad categories right you have your psu defense stocks in the aerospace and army space and you have your psu defense stocks in the navy space and then you have private defense players um and i think we're going to be releasing subsequent podcasts on the psu navy space and and private sector uh defense providers but let's uh let's talk about you know the psu defense space and which the big companies in the room are and 
just to maybe set some context for our viewers, there's 21 companies that fall within, you know, the defense space, and they have a total market cap of just $40 billion, as opposed to $3 trillion, which is the overall market cap. And 78% of that value is locked into PSU defense stocks. Um, so they're really they're the big player in the room, they're the majority of what's on the table as far as defense goes. Um, so what are the big PSU defense players, non-Navy? See, it's uh, the non-Navy uh, defense players, of course, are Hindustan Aeronautics, Bharat Dynamics, and Bharat Electronics. But let's understand where defense spending is happening globally. Mm -hmm. See, what has happened over the years is that now wars are fought in the air, mm -hmm. in the skies, and on the, on the, in the oceans, right? So it's all about missiles. It's about airplanes flying over, mm -hmm. light combat airplanes, helicopters. So all of this has to do with a lot of electronic and electrical mm -hmm. equipment mm -hmm. and a lot of software in it, a lot of sensors and there's so many complex technologies which have come into play. Yeah. It's not like conventional warfare where you just needed tanks and you needed soldiers and, and uh, rifles and stuff like that. Absolutely. It's more, more and more high tech. So yeah, to speak. It's a technology driven battlefield, exactly. not a human driven battlefield. Exactly. So that's where I think the Indian PSUs which have focused on electronic and electrical and related technologies, they're the ones who are actually having their cake and eating it. So mm -hmm. the top amongst them is Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, right? It's the only airplane manufacturing company in India. Mm -hmm. Okay, we don't have a domestic airplane manufacturing company like Boeing or Airbus, but we have HAL, which manufactures planes as well as light combat helicopters as well. Mm -hmm. And these technologies are very, very difficult to absorb, to assimilate, and to then actually put into practice, they require years and years of uh, research and development and testing, yeah, so that they are at least worthy for battle. Yeah, let's. I mean, let's maybe give some context here. So, just to, I guess inform our viewers of all the aircraft purchases, of all the aerial purchases made by the Air Force and you know maybe even carrier groups for the Navy, only fifty six percent of all components are produced indigenously, and that obscures an even more complex reality where some of the most important systems associated with aircrafts are not at all manufactured indigenously, particularly jet engines uh, and the engines for helicopters, which is one of the, the largest value holders in the airplane space. I mean, that's that's changed or will we hope it will change with, with recent G, announcements. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But we'll know. come to that when we talk about Hindustan Aeronautics in a second. And another really important piece that I wanted to maybe share uh, to give a sense of the demand. Now, I mean, India traditionally anchors its military to Pakistan, but I, I don't particularly buy into that theory. I think, well, I think should, it's way beyond that yeah. now. We are, we are not, Pakistan is not the only enemy. No, only we need to threat. anchor our military to the Chinese military. Absolutely. So just some context. China has 1,300 active combat aircraft and India has only 500. So wow. we have a long, long way to go. And, and please keep in mind that not only do the Chinese have... Uh, a larger you know base of aircraft but they're also producing them faster and from a technological perspective uh, I think the Tejas Mark II is I think uh, a third 3.5 generation air combat fighter but the the most recent Chinese aircraft fighter is I think stage four uh, the US has reached stage five so I think we're both playing a little bit of catch-up but again in terms of anchoring our military we have a long way to go in the aerospace area that's what I think, and that's where diplomatic, uh, uh, you know, I would say policies come into play, maneuvering comes into play, because we are dependent on China, as well, sorry, dependent on US, as well as Russia for technology transfer, both mm -hmm. our hub friends, as Absolutely. we have seen that. And I think this recent visit of uh, Narendra Modi to the US opens up, hopefully, a lot of technology transfer mm -hmm. into India, because these things can take years and years to develop, but somebody's already developed it, they can give you the technology transfer. It's it very fast yeah. tracks. But yeah. I, I mean, I don't want to pour cold water on that, but I should point out that the US has not, nor will it ever, um, transfer its most advanced or near most advanced technologies to anybody, not even its NATO allies. But China is rapidly catching up. So in things like stealth, um, particularly, I think we need to remember that we need to develop indigenous capabilities uh, rather than relying on technology transfer. Absolutely, and that's where defense stocks come into play because 
they are the medium from which we can develop all these technologies and we can modernize our um, mm -hmm. entire defense forces, which yeah. is why I think these companies have a great, great future. Mm -hmm. Because although they were not, we hope that there never is any, any war or any uh, such skirmishes, but uh, we need to continuously modernize our equipment, mm -hmm. continuously need to modernize our Army, Navy and Air Force. Which is why I think these companies, defense companies, will have business going for years and years on Yeah, it. yeah, absolutely. And, and the business will continue to grow. So just some context for you. Um, India spends approximately 2.5% of its nominal GDP on military expenditures. And that stayed consistent over the last decade. And with nominal GB, GDP expected to grow at 11 12%, their revenues will also grow at 11 12% because defense spending will continue to go up at that rate. So I guess without further ado, I think we know that there's a lot of demand and we know that these, uh, these companies are critical to our security. Absolutely. Um, why don't we dive into some of the big PSU aerospace defense players? There's only one. <laughs> so yeah. Hindustan Aeronautics. It's, I think actually, uh, if you look at the entire market and look at what the analysts have to stay, this is the best pick in the defense sector per se. And rightly so, it's the largest defense company in terms of market capitalization and a unique position in the defense space considering that they manufacture aircrafts and they manufacture also helicopters and they have a very thriving business of maintenance and repairs as well. Right. So let's give our viewers a little bit of context about Hindustan yes, Aeronautics, that, just yeah. some of its financials. Um, so the three figures that we generally track here are order book, which is the total orders received, uh, the revenue, which is broadly how much they earn in a given year, and the profit, which is how much they make after their expenses. Yes. And over the last five years, Hindustan Aeronautics order book has grown at 6.9% compounded. Their revenues have grown at a similar pace of about 6.12% compounded. And their profit, though surprisingly, has grown at near 20% compounded over the last five you years. You know why? Value addition. See, from, uh, from as, 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 in, as the products become more and more expensive, more and more premium, so to mm -hmm. speak, more technology inten incentive, uh, intensive, that's where I think the operating profit margins also go up. Mm -hmm. And don't get fooled by the 6% order book growth rate. The order book grows in step form for mm -hmm. all defense companies. So two, three big orders, 20, 30,000 crores worth of orders, and suddenly you find that when you down the line, the order book growth has gone from 6% to 12% or so. Right. And it's worth just highlighting that point that from FY20 to FY21, the order book grew 50%. Exactly. So Single big order, 50,000 to 80,000 crores. Exactly. So these things happen. And that's the underlying characteristic of defense stocks mm -hmm. is that they are not secular growth moment, mm -hmm. uh, growth stories. You, know, you won't get that 10% every year after year which you get an FMCG or some of the other consumption oriented stocks. These businesses, they grow in a very block manner. Mm -hmm. and suddenly you'd have two, three years where the order book goes up mm -hmm. and two, three years, they'll have intense growth rates as those order books are executed. And then you may have flat to declining profits as well. Right. A lot of the products which they make are long gestation products and they get paid only on a percentage of completion basis. So there is a lot of uh, technicalities involved in how these businesses are run as well. I think it's a really important point that you've highlighted, that there's step form growth, but it doesn't seem like the stock price has really operated in that manner. And let's maybe highlight again for our viewers some of the key figures involved here. So um, over the last five years, Hindustan Aeronautics has compounded at 34%. Although to be fair, a lot of that has come in the last one year where it's grown at 110%. So that's, it's a, its stock price has effectively doubled. and it not only has it doubled, it's only doubled to 21 PE, which is, I mean, if you compare with the Nifty's long-term average of 20, it's really right there. Yeah, that's right, I think, because, you know, stocks like Hindustan Aeronautics and other peer group companies in defense, they've been listed for many, many decades, right? Uh, but somehow the, the market never favored them because their performance was very, very, I would say, ordinary a very average until about four or five years ago or so. And this entire story about Atmanirbhar, self-sufficiency in defense, making a great deal of effort to indigenize our production was not there earlier. So it's only when this particular uh, policies of the government came into play, that's when investors you know, like 
looked up to Hindustan Aeronautics and similar companies. And from a period where, from a time where they were valued at single digit price to earnings multiple, their price to earnings multiple has expanded. Means the valuation ratios have expanded in the last three, four years because they are seeing the potential and the more importantly, long term potential right. of the defense business. Yeah. And I think. Uh I think there's a lot of people that might share this view because, you know, an interesting thing to note, the government may own 71% of this company, but FIIs own 9% of this company. And it's all of it come in the last two, three years, I would say. Absolutely. So I think from that point of view, uh, you know, it's a stock which is there in many of the portfolios of key investors. Mm -hmm. And people are looking at the visibility of the next three to five years or so, given the kind of order book position is there and the kind of rollout which mm -hmm. they're expecting. Mm -hmm. So which means that, you know, three years down the line, this company could you know, double in size mm -hmm. and that's being reflected in the stock price. So, right. and I would say that maybe right now the stock may appear to be overpriced, but you know, you get these opportunities in defense stocks. There always is a bad quarter around the corner. As I said, there's a lot of lumpiness and volatility in their earnings. And there could be minor periods of disenchantment that's the time when you have to buy into a defense stock like HAL. Mm -hmm. You have to play a slightly contrarian strategy over here. Right. You cannot buy with good numbers. You have to try and buy when the numbers are not that great. And you'll have that quarter once in a while. Of course, of course. So let's, uh, I guess maybe let's give our viewers a little bit of a sense of what HAL's quote unquote main products are. So aerospace generally functions on platforms. Most defense works on platforms, right? You have... Um, for HL, you have the two big platforms of the Tejas light combat vehicle, uh, sorry, light combat aircraft. And you have the Chetak and the Cheetah, sorry, the, uh, yeah, the, the Chetak and the Cheetah helicopters, which are light combat helicopters. Nice names. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. So I think that all of these three have got great potential and they keep on getting newer and newer versions. Mm -hmm. And the earlier versions uh, have to be weeded out. They have to be, you know, kind of retired and new new generation uh, aircrafts and helicopters will definitely come into play of course so and the g uh, and g is now signed an mou with hal to jointly produce the ge engine. jet engines which will power the tejas aircraft platform going forward and not only will they jointly produce them but there's also an element of technology transfer so that really big piece that was missing for hal uh, where they weren't able to manufacture jet engines now that's in-house and so that much more value add is feasible. Absolutely. So from that point of view, given its size, given its position in the industry, I would say it's amongst the topmost defense stocks. But as I said, I think you need to have a slightly contrarian uh, strategy over here. So let's talk about the next company, you know, moving on from uh, HEL, Bharat Electronics, something that's really critical to the entire defense supply chain. Uh, do you want to give some context as to what makes Bharat Electronics so critical to um, the overall defense of India? It's in the middle name, electronics. So all warfare is now electronics, software based, electrical, systems, and that's where Bharat Electronics comes into play. And it's one company which spends almost 8% of its revenues on R&D, which is what keeps it ahead of the curve, which is what keeps it relevant. And I think the success of Bharat Electronics is very, very important for India's defense uh, you know, self-sufficiency and India's modernization in terms of its defense equipment because more and more technology is going into defense equipment and that's where Bharat Electronics plays a very very important role and this is one company which will keep on getting new orders as new technologies also come into play and now we have this AI and whatnot so that's Absolutely. going to come into defense equipment, yeah, yeah. defense procurement and I think Bharat Electronics has a major role to play in these new technologies coming uh, into the world. Yeah, so let's just very rapidly give our viewers a sense of, you know, what Bharat Electronics is as a company. Um, again, the order book, I, I think, as you mentioned, it hasn't really grown very much because, you know, I don't think it's reached the next step yet. Over the last five years, just 3.22% compounded growth. Uh, but their revenues and profits have grown fairly healthily, as you know, I assume they've executed uh, the orders they've received and, and added more value. Value so, addition. See, always operating profit margins is the key thing. And you know, Varun, we are talking about price to earnings multiple, they go hand in hand with how margins increase as well. Right. So again, uh, revenues grown at about 7.8% uh, over the last five years compounded, profit at 9.6%, which is fairly healthy. 
And from a market perspective, I think, uh, as you pointed out, they add a lot of value. And so their PE is almost 29, uh, which I think reflects the the importance that they place on their R&D. I would think that their net profit growth will be significantly higher going ahead or so. Uh, because, you know, these are long gestation projects. And as and when new systems come into play, new deliveries come into play, which are of a higher value add, and then the operating leverages also come into play for such companies, I expect that Bharat Electronics should do extremely well going ahead as well. But again, as I said in the case of HAL also, you got to choose, when, to, quarter, yeah. you gotta choose when you want to play that stock. Exactly. And I think uh, investors would really agree with you because if you look at the performance of Bharat Electronics, last 10 years, the stock has grown at a compounded 25%. A lot of it is back-ended, right? As of course. Know. Of course, a lot of it is back end. Last year, it's grown at 60%. So that the recent surge of the last five years where it's grown at 28% compounded would have really helped these numbers. Yeah, now that you tell me, maybe I think we should just wait for it to just flatten out and, and buy it up when there's a correction or so. Right. Also, you know, Varun, I think a very important uh, uh, thought comes to my mind is that when we are in a bull market as we are, then typically investors want to go for small mid-cap companies in high growth sectors or in sectors which are cyclical and which are receiving, which are in the midst of an up cycle, whether it's capital goods or banking, auto, auto ancillary, which have all we've discussed. But defense really is not the, not the sector to buy when we are in a raging bull market. Mm -hmm. It's a great uh, defensive play yeah. in a bear market. And if you see the best years of the defense stocks, the appreciation was in the bear markets where markets were flat mm -hmm. last three, four years or so. Right. And that's where a lot of money went into because of the visibility of earnings mm -hmm. and because of the potential of the sector. Right. Okay. No, that's that's very interesting to note. And um, yeah, I think that we'll, I think, I hope our viewers will keep that in mind Absolutely. when uh, when they're making investment decisions. Let's move on to the last major, you know, PSU defense stock, Bharat Dynamics. And uh, I want to take a second to talk about Bharat Dynamics and, and I guess the importance that I personally attach to Bharat Dynamics. So Bharat Dynamics is primarily a missile producer, That's right. <laughs> right? And uh, they're responsible for, the, for providing components to the Brahmos ecosystem. They have a beyond visual range, um, air to air weapon, air to surface weapon. And you know, they have a deep uh, supply chain in the missile space. And just to maybe give some context to this. So one of the big trends emerging out of the Russia-Ukraine war has been that the skies have been clear. Um, which is to say that even, even though Russia has a 4.5 generation fighter, they have not deployed it at all. And that's because of the prevalence of missiles. That's why I think uh, missiles are the new army or so to speak, the new foot soldier. And they are the to land first in the enemy territory even before perhaps the aircraft start moving into their airspace. From that point of view, India needs a very sophisticated missile system for defense as well as attack. And that's where a company like Bharat Dynamics, which has been around for decades and decades, comes into play. Mm -hmm. And the way the technological advancements have been taking place in the missile technology, mm -hmm. it's only fair to assume that Bharat Dynamics has a long way to go. And they'll be scouting as well as doing more and more R&D on new technologies. And this is all about creating more accuracy and greater distance at which the missiles can mm -hmm. go and also end of the day reliability. Mm -hmm. And all of these are very important from India's defense point of view. And again, I think the common thread between HAL, Bharat Electronics and Bharat Dynamics is uh, the fact that they require high, it's high tech, it's all electronics, it's all systems, software, and that's where the, I would say, the moat is around these companies. I mean, I can't imagine a private sector getting ever into these kind of technologies. I think the government will not allow it. Yeah. And even if they do, foreign players will not trust a private mm -hmm. sector company with such technologies. So from that point of view, the PSU defense companies we've spoken about, they have a very, very strong moat. It's, it's, a, it's a business where there's hardly any competition. Absolutely. It's what can you deliver? What can you offer? Absolutely. There's a ready market. So in a way, it's a seller's market for these companies. Yeah. And I think that's reflected in Bharat Dynamics uh, numbers. So over the last five years, their order book has grown at 22.9% compounded. And against that though, their revenues have shrunk by 5% year on year over the last five years. Although profitability has grown at 2.6% compounded over the last five years. So it seems like they have an execution problem, even though they have unlimited demand. 
That's where I think, and I think sooner or later it will reach an inflection point where it should start growing at 15-16% or so. That's the street expectation and I do tend to agree with it that uh, as I said, you know, these businesses go in a step form mm -hmm. and all of these companies, I think you should see accelerated growth over the next 3-4 years and that's true for a lot of defense companies including the shipbuilders which we will discuss but the fact remains that uh, they are just on takeoff stage when it comes to their earnings. And markets have discounted this growth in advance, which is why stock prices have rallied. Yeah, and it's worth mentioning, right? So Bharat uh, Electronics is trading at 29p, HCL is trading at 21p, but Bharat Dynamics is trading at 57. So the street is very much expecting, you know, orders of magnitude growth very rapidly from Bharat Dynamics which maybe they're not expecting as much from HAL or Bharat Electronics. See, also sometimes uh, shareholding pattern, liquidity, all these things also play a role. And I would say that at this point, it does seem to be a bit expensive. But as I said, I think Contradent plays the need as when it comes to defense stocks. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, another, another really interesting side note that I want to talk about when I talk about Bharat Dynamics is if we take, you know, maybe a step back 10 years ago or so, there were really two large military exporters in the world. You had the US and you had Russia. And they, between them, accounted for about 50-60% of the market. Russia in particular had 16% of the market. But India is one of the few countries, maybe like three or four, that has a fully indigenized missile supply chain. And with the importance of missiles in particular, I think Bharat Dynamics is very well placed to not only become a local you know, a local production powerhouse, but also an export powerhouse. That's a very interesting point, Varun, we did not discuss, but all of these companies, HAL, Bharat Electronics, Bharat Dynamics, are all have a great potential when it comes to exports. Right. Because of India's low cost production. Right. And, and the demand globally. Right. To move away from US and Russia. Before we get into that though, I think that's something we're going to talk about in our next podcast. So our viewers have something to uh, dial into. And, uh, you know, hopefully next time we'll be able to talk about some of the private sector defense players to sort of contrast with the public sector defense players and uh, maybe leave the viewers with even more choice when it comes to defense stocks. Absolutely. I think look forward to it in the next podcast. This podcast is produced by Elixir Equities Private Limited, a Savvy Registered Research Analyst. Registration number INA 00004787. The information provided in this podcast is for educational and informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Investment in securities market are subject to market risk. We strongly advise all investors to read all related documents carefully before investing. The securities quoted in this podcast are for illustrative purposes only and are not recommendations for investments. Registration granted by SEBI and certification from NISM in no way guarantees the performance of the intermediary or any providers of any assurance of returns to investors. Deepa Mehta, Varun Mehta, Pesa Smart, its parent company, Elixir Equities Private Limited, or any of its associates do not hold any financial interest of more than 1% in any of the company's or financial assets covered by us. We or our clients, relatives, or associates may have an investment position of less than 1% in the companies covered by us. We have not received any compensation from any of the companies covered by us and we do not provide any services to them. Our views are based on publicly available information. We strongly advise educators to evaluate market conditions and risk independently before making any investment decisions. This podcast should not be considered as a substitute for professional financial advice. Elixir Equities Private Limited, Deepa Mehta, Varun Mehta, Pesa Smart, and its associates shall not be held responsible for any financial losses or damages incurred as a result of acting on the information provided herein. This disclaimer is subject to update and modification without notice. We encourage our listeners to regularly review this disclaimer.